comments and reports about a possible rivalry between Princess Diana and Elizabeth II are commonplace. But when we shun the camp of conspiratorial speculation, we realize that the facts tell another story. Princess Diana's presence in the British royal family changed a lot, and the Queen had to adapt to keep the family relevant. Queen Elizabeth II, monopolized by her duty to the nation, was formal and often absent as a mother, or she lived submerged in the red boxes with the state paperwork. For the royal family, Charles's obsession with Camilla had gone from being an acceptable flirtation to becoming a serious barrier to marriage. Moreover, it provoked unsavory gossip. Charles was 31, far beyond the age at which he had always promised he would marry. He had to find a bride quickly. But who? She had to be noble, with a pultritudinous reputation, and a virgin. In 1980, if Diana didn't exist, they would have to invent her. The first person in the royal family who noticed Diana was the Queen Mother, Elizabeth Bowles Lyon. She told her grandson that she could not miss the chance to marry Diana Spencer. She started inviting the young woman to numerous events where Prince Charles was present. Then, Queen Elizabeth II decided to have the young lady invited to spend a weekend at Balmoral Castle with the royal family. Balmoral must have been an intimidating setting for Diana. She endured the royal food, received compliments from Prince Philip, showed her housekeeping skills, and walked with the prince around the lake. Diana, showing she was so happy walking slowly across the soggy plains, came out the winner. The queen found her charming and suitable. Diana had no idea what her life would be like as a Windsor, resulting from the differences in their ages, interests, and backgrounds, the success of the marriage would require considerable luck. The idea that the marriage between Charles and Diana would strengthen the royal family was shared by the queen, Prince Philip, several passionate monarchists, almost all the media, and the royal bride and groom themselves. Contrary to what many people think, Diana was accepted and chosen by the royal family. The couple could only unite with the queen's approval. It was not something arranged. Questioned once about this, Diana reacted angrily. The engagement proposal had to be approved by Elizabeth. Charles, in turn, was afraid that he would regret the union and dishonor the family. However, when the engagement took place, the queen believed that the young woman would not adapt easily. In 1981, in a letter to a friend, Elizabeth expressed, I think Diana will live here less than expected. The wonderment felt by Diana was favorable to her in the first months. She even swam every day in the palace pool. But over time, all the unwanted appointments left her bored and stressed. The wedding between Lady Di and Prince Charles took place on June the 29th, 1981. The event brought the entire city of London to a standstill. About 750 million people watched the ceremony worldwide. One person was particularly happy. Queen Elizabeth II was seen standing next to the bride and groom, looking triumphant to finally see their heir to the throne marrying a girl who represented the dynasty's future. Within the royal family, Diana played an important role for Queen Elizabeth II. Her relationship with Prince Charles could befit the image of the royal family when the blonde girl did her charitable deeds or, wearing a beautiful dress, exuded the elegance that Buckingham Palace merited. But the mechanized wedding had a schedule fraught with protocols and grueling procedures. In addition, the relationship of ups and downs with the Queen, who at times seemed like a second mother, for better or worse, caused an intense emotional drain on Diana. With the support of her husband, Diana developed bulimia, sometimes feeding herself only with ice cubes. Moreover, her mental health became increasingly unstable. Initially, this was ignored by the palace staff and the queen, believing that the young woman just needed time to settle in and adapt. On their honeymoon, Diana and Charles took a cruise on the Mediterranean. After a fortnight full of arguments, the young woman became severely debilitated. A doctor was called at the prince's request, and he stated that Diana suffered from mood swings, with symptoms such as fear of abandonment, histrionic behavior, and a need for adoration. Elizabeth was empathetic to her daughter-in-law. Although Charles was used to that way of life, Diana had no experience in romance, much less royalty. After William's birth, 
Diana had a severe depression and lost considerable weight. She began to cancel engagements and regularly argued with Charles, who found himself unable to understand his wife's situation. Realizing the difficulties in the royal marriage, Queen Elizabeth reportedly summoned Diana for a private conversation. Diana told Andrew Morton that the Queen mentioned that the reason the marriage failed was that Prince Charles had difficulty accepting my bulimia. She saw it as the cause of the marriage problems rather than a symptom. I kept quiet. I didn't ask her for advice. I can now take care of myself. The Queen's conclusions were derived from her marriage to Prince Philip. She hoped that time could work things out, just as it had for her. Queen Elizabeth II seemed not to understand the incompatibility issues between the prince and the princess. With the birth in William 1982 and Harry in 1984, the queen expected tensions to ease. However, now that the monarch was closer to the young woman, she witnessed Diana's moments of panic as she called and visited her mother-in-law several times, seeking psychological support. The unscheduled visits disrupted the queen's regular routine, and she felt helpless before her daughter-in-law's despair. When Diana discovered Charles's betrayal of Camilla Parker Bowles, Queen Elizabeth was warned and tried to support both sides, choosing to shield her son. She even compared her daughter-in-law to a nervous racehorse who needed careful treatment. But she also believed that Diana needed to have the independence she wanted. Until that point, the relationship between the two was one of trust. Even Diana's breaches of royal protocol were tolerated by the queen, who looked favorably on the princess's good deeds, but hated her constant exposure to photographers. The relationship between the two women worsened in 1992, when Diana collaborated with journalist Andrew Morton to write the book Diana, Her True Story. The book had plenty of information about Diana's marital hell, revealing the contempt shown by a compassionless family while protecting her image as a princess. Regarding Elizabeth, Diana stated that from day one she knew she would not be close to the monarch. Nobody told me that. I just felt it. Yes, the relationship changed when we got engaged because I was a threat, right? I look up to her. I want to understand her better and talk to her. And I will do that. I always told her, I will never let you down. But I can't say the same about your son. William and Henry's mother claimed the words were well received by the Queen and that she was comfortable with her presence. But in a major misunderstanding, the Sovereign reportedly said that her relationship with Charles had not worked out because of her bulimia, a crucial point in the marriage breakdown. Kenny Rivett, a close friend of the Princess, said that the legal separation process began after Elizabeth's involvement in the matter. On December the 20th, 1995, the Queen decided to call the Princess. This intervention saved Charles from all that imbroglio. The Queen was going to end the marriage, not the Prince of Wales. On the same day, Charles sent a letter to the Princess, saying that the marriage was beyond repair, which represented a personal and national tragedy. Diana hired one of the best lawyers of that time and filed for divorce. She wanted custody of her children, to continue to live in Kensington, to be paid 30 million pounds and to retain the title Her Royal Highness. The Queen agreed to the first three, but would never let her keep the title. With no alternative, Diana gave in. On July the 13th, the divorce agreement was sealed on Diana's terms. For her, it was a sweet and clear victory. She had lost her title, but gained financial independence for the first time in her life. After another controversial interview by Diana, this time, given to the presenter Martin Bashir in 1995, the Queen was upset by the statements of her former daughter-in-law, which shook the relationship between the two. However, Elizabeth continued to respect her daughter-in-law, unlike other members of the royal family. For example, Princess Margaret did not even care about Diana. Diana went on with her life outside the royal family, doing numerous humanitarian campaigns and being the star she had always been until then. The situation changed abruptly on August the 31st, 1997. Princess Diana was killed in a car accident in Paris. For a week, until the ultimate mass-attended funeral, the United Kingdom went through an unprecedented turmoil which shook the monarchy. The news of Princess Diana's death dropped like a bomb in England. 
The subjects were bewildered and the Queen paralyzed in one of the greatest crises of the British monarchy in the last seven decades. People quickly filled the streets, lit candles, and turned the facades of Kensington Palace, Buckingham Palace, and Westminster Abbey into a sea of roses and other mementos. Mourning turned into a mass movement for change. It was a supreme moment of national action, something threatening to the royal family. On the night of the accident, Queen Elizabeth II was with her family at Balmoral, where it was their custom to spend the summer. In the early hours of the 31st, they were awakened by aides, informing them that Diana was seriously injured. At 3 a.m. on Sunday morning, the Windsors were informed that the princess had died. Immediately, a protective cocoon was established around Princess Henry and William. Anything that could hurt them, such as television news, radio, newspapers, and magazines, was to be kept out of their reach. The Queen maintained silence for a long time, and the subjects grew increasingly nervous. Charles went over to Paris to prepare the transport of the princess's body. The prince had the royal flag placed over Diana's coffin as it left the hospital for England. Upon arrival, a crowd of people awaited the procession, which made its way to a private morgue and then to St. James's Palace. Diana's family had wanted an intimate, private funeral, but in the face of public commotion, that was impossible. The Queen's cabinet and secretaries arranged the details of the public funeral in Westminster Abbey. The palace flag became a small but telling problem. There was no flag flying at Buckingham Palace. Protocol said that the royal standard could only be flown when the Queen was in the palace, and the bare flagpole became a symbol of an unsympathetic monarch. In the end, the Queen asked that the flag of the United Kingdom, which had never been raised before, be raised at half-mast. A new tradition was created, as today the flag is usually raised when the king is not in the palace and left at half-mass as a sign of mourning. On Thursday, news broke that the queen and her family will be traveling to London. The English reacted with some relief. When the car carrying the sovereign and the Duke of Edinburgh was spotted by people, there was a round of applause. During those days, a survey of people on the streets concluded that one in four Englishmen wished for an end to the monarchy. After arriving, Elizabeth and Philip strolled past the plethora of roses left at the gates of Buckingham Palace, containing hostile messages for them and the rest of the royal family. But something changed the situation. A little girl extended a bouquet of flowers to the monarch as she walked in front of Kensington Palace. Elizabeth approached the child and asked, Are these for Diana? The little girl replied, no, they are for you. The subjects might have been upset with their queen, but nevertheless, they still adored her. On Friday, September the 5th, the day before the funeral, the sovereign gave a speech broadcast by the BBC to all of her subjects. Her address to the nation began promptly at 6 p.m. Dressed in black and wearing pearls, Elizabeth spoke for three minutes and six seconds in a monotonous tone. She wore prescription glasses to read the text on the teleprompter. It was the second time the Queen had made a live televised speech of exceptional character. The funeral took place on Saturday, September the 6th. When the convoy passed through the gates of Buckingham, Elizabeth, in an even more unusual gesture, bowed her head before Diana's coffin, whose death had caused the greatest crisis in the institution that the Queen had overseen for almost 50 years. The Queen's attitude, seen as disrespectful and apathetic to her subjects at the time, can be understood as an act of a grandmother trying to protect her grandchildren from the trauma of losing a mother so soon. In a BBC interview with Prince William, he stated that the moment he marched behind his mother's coffin was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I just remember hiding behind my bangs. I had a lot of hair at that time and kept my head down. The siblings praised their grandmother, who braved the public backlash by staying by their side in Balmoral in the difficult days after their mother's death. I think it was a hard decision for our grandmother. She was torn between being the grandmother to Harry and me and her role as Queen, William said. Harry also talked about their trip from Scotland to London. People were touching us and pulling us by the arms. I don't blame them, but it was shocking. They were screaming, crying and by their hands were wet with the tears they had just wiped away before they shook my hand," he recalled. The Queen came out of that episode wiser, perhaps sadder, certainly, 
but stronger too. Her relationship with Princess Diana was not what the tabloid media claim. However, struck in monarchical traditionalism, the queen could not help the princess much. But between the two, a relationship of respect and admiration existed. According to biographer Andrew Morton, the queen learned a few things from the princess's time in the royal family. One of the many ironies of the queen's life is that Diana's impact on the royal family is measured by the current adaptive capacity of the House of Windsor to newcomers. It is remarkable how often the queen appeared alongside Kate Middleton in the early days of her royal career. Lessons were learned, but at a costly price, said the biographer. Still, we must remember that Harry and Meghan Markle decided to relinquish the title Her Royal Highness and public funding, giving up their active membership in the royal family.